And uh, thank you all for your uh, commitment to these important issues in, in being here this afternoon. Uh, I, I was asked to respond to the question, where to from here? And my first response is that we need to seize the high moral ground. Now, in the political party that I was a member of for over 40 years, there is a saying, in the race of life, always back the horse called self-interest. It doesn't always win, but it gives you a bloody good run for your money. And because population stability would serve so many Australians, particularly younger ones, better than rapid population growth, it is indeed very tempting for us to pitch our arguments in that direction. But the population debate is not fundamentally a, a debate about putting a few more dollars in people's pockets. It is a debate about values. It is a debate about what kind of world we are going to live in and what kind of world we are going to pass on to our children. I don't know about you, but I am sick to death of commentators and social media smart Alex trying to paint anyone who raises the issue of population as racist or selfish. The opposite is the truth and we should unashamedly claim the high moral ground. In August, it will be 10 years since I first advanced in the Federal Parliament two propositions, that the world had a population problem and that Australia has a population problem. As the 10th anniversary approaches, I've reflected on what has been achieved since then, and the short answer is not much. There are few signs of a shift towards population stability and sustainability, either globally or here in Australia, and the debate about population continues to be dominated by the greed of the political right and the vanity of the political left. But to get a clearer perspective on the population issue, I prefer to go back not 10 years to 2009, but 50 years to 1969. In the summer of 1969, Brian Adams was playing his guitar until his fingers bled. I, I was a teenager getting interested in the environment and politics. My father and I got involved in the campaign to save the Little Desert and the Lower Glenelg in Victoria from being cleared for agriculture. It was a time that seemed to me to mark the establishment of the modern conservation movement, not just in Victoria, but in many other parts of the world. And I had a very rosy view of the future. I thought Australia's pioneers had made a lot of environmental mistakes, but we were learning from those mistakes and that in future we were going to properly protect our unique and beautiful birds, plants and animals. I had a pretty rosy view about everything else too. I thought that not only were we lifting our environmental game, but that everything would get better. Now, what has actually happened in the last 50 years? Well, the world's population has more than doubled, 3.6 billion back then, 7.7 .7 billion now. And Australia's population has also more than doubled, 12 and a quarter million back then, 25 million now. The effect of this on the world's wildlife has been catastrophic. The latest WWF Living Planet report says that since 1970, 60% of the population of all mammals, birds, reptiles and fish has been lost. 60% in less than 50 years. I think Hugh Possingham referred to this. This is terrible. It's a disgrace. It makes an absolute mockery of the idea that we're decoupling growth from environmental damage, that we can continue to grow and our wildlife won't disappear. Let me repeat, in the last 50 years, our numbers went up by over 50%, the world's wildlife down by 60%. This is no coincidence. As has been noted by the Overpopulation Project, the total weight of vertebrate land animals 10,000 years ago was humans 1%, animals 99%. Today, it is wild animals who are the 1%, we are 32%, and our domestic livestock are 67%. In my view, there are two aspects to claiming the high moral ground. The first is to focus on this environmental havoc and destruction, and part of this should involve uh, being concerned about the climate change debate. Um, the Victorian Greenhouse Gas Emissions Report shows total net emissions went up by 7% between 1990 and 2016, transport emissions even more so. That report explicitly noted that population growth is an important driver of emissions trend in a number of sectors and subsectors. 
So Victoria's rapid population growth of over 100,000 every year fatally undermines all the good work being done by government departments and agencies and councils and community groups and households and families and individuals to reduce our greenhouse emissions. It is indeed pretty hard to reduce your carbon footprint when you keep adding more feet. We need to cultivate a knowledge and love of the natural world. We should be demanding that environmental education be taught in schools and that our children are given contact with nature. People will value and protect what they know and love and the level of ecological ignorance and illiteracy in the year 2019 is frightening and it's a point that was made in discussion this afternoon. We need to act as if other species mattered as much as our own and accept that we have a moral responsibility to share resources with other species. I also think we should note the comments of uh, Dr Freya Matthews who says that taking biodiversity preservation as the central goal of conservation sets the bar too low. Preventing species from becoming extinct is too modest. Conservationists want to preserve abundant, wild nature. When we get to the point where our children will only see a platypus or a bandicoot in a zoo or a cartoon, or we're down to our last few hundred lions and tigers being restricted to isolated, disconnected refuges, more and more of which are gated, high security compounds, then we've pretty much lost the plot. To its great credit, Zoos Victoria has an extinction denied program that includes captive breeding orange bellied parrots. However, some of the parrots can't get enough feed in the wild to get the strength to fly across Bass Strait, uh, which is orange bellied parrot custom and practice. So Qantas has been flying them across in planes. <laughs> it feels like life imitating art where Air, Air New Zealand commercials star a white duck flying across by plane uh, across the Tasman. Now I give full marks to Zoos Victoria and Qantas for their efforts and commitment. But when the birds need a plane to get across Bass Strait, this is not nature in its awe-inspiring beauty and diversity. These are pathetic, splintered remnants of a world that we've laid waste to. Wild animals are like sovereign peoples entitled to their territories and ecological estates. We have no right to dispossess them of their ranges or degrade their environment to the point where it can no longer sustain them. And we need to seize the high moral ground by focusing on the state of the environment. One immediate aspect of this, which I encourage you to contact your election candidates and representatives about during this election campaign and indeed beyond, is vegetation cover, tree canopy cover. We need our trees and plants and grasses. It is not just an environmental question, it is a public health one. The good news is that drones and satellite imagery and the like enable vegetation cover to be monitored with a degree of precision that we've never had before. The bad news is that our vegetation canopy cover is declining. So I urge you to contact your political representatives and candidates and ask them to commit to maintaining and where possible increasing the vegetation canopy cover in your electorate on both public and private land. People simply have to stop bulldozing and chopping trees and shrubs down. It has to stop. The second aspect of seizing the high moral ground is to put population in a global context. Much of our discussion focuses on Australia, as it should, but it seems to me that unless there is action in other countries, no matter what we do in Australia, the world is still going to go to hell in a handbasket, and secondly, that much of our credibility and moral authority comes from taking the global view. We need to build alliances with like-minded people in other countries and particularly build alliances across religious and ethnic divides. An important aspect of focusing on the issue of rapid population growth is that uh, we have to deal with this magic pudding myth which is implicit in much of the political debate uh, including from politicians and activists on the left who ought to know better and it goes like this that the world's poor can achieve western standards of living that people living in western countries will be able to more or less maintain their standards of living that we can maintain our current rate of population growth and we can protect the environment it is a lie You've heard Al Gore talking about climate change as an inconvenient truth. Well, this is a convenient lie. It enables environmental groups to duck the population issue. 
but it is a monstrous and deceitful lie. And researchers who've looked at this say there could be a European, there could be a European standard of living uh, for everyone with sustainable use of our natural resources, provided the Earth's population was no more than two billion. Now, like the environmental question, there are ways of raising the global population issue in the current federal election and beyond. There's been some great work done by Rob Harding promoting the idea of a United Nations Global Population Stabilisation Treaty. This seems to me to have a lot of potential uh, and I encourage people to contact candidates and elected representatives during this election campaign and beyond and ask them, would you support Australia sponsoring a population treaty at the United Nations that committed each country to stabilising its own population? So, in conclusion, the question I was asked to answer, where to from here, seize the high moral ground with a focus on the environment and global population issues. Secondly, push elected representatives with challenging but not unreasonable asks like the maintenance of our remaining vegetation cover and support for a global population treaty. And I would add to that, face up to the fact that the Liberal, Labor and Greens parties are not going to move on this issue at anything other than the point of an electoral gun and conduct ourselves accordingly. And as for the question this forum asks, what future do we want for Australia? The future I want is one in which my children and their generation have the same job security and opportunity that we had and can afford a post-secondary education and a house with a garden and the chance to see owls and platypus in the wild the way that we could and that the orange-bellied parrots can fly across Bass Strait without a boarding pass. <laughs> Thank you.